I can remember on one occasion, she was waiting by the riverside for the boats to come down. She had petrol and she had stores to give us. It was a remote area, nobody around, and a bear came out of the woods right next to her. She had a 44 Magnum revolver, um, which in her fear and haste, she shot herself through the boot, um, but it was enough to frighten the bear away. She was tough, Ginny was very, very tough. I only then realized what an amazing person she was. She, with her blue eyes, there were some quite troublesome people on that expedition, but with her blue eyes, she could frighten very big men. I joined the Trans Globe to set up the polar training. Ginny was doing the radio work, which meant that she was out um, in her radio hut, uh, could be for 24 hours at the time, doing communications. And my, it was my job to keep the generators running for her. She was fantastically feisty at having to go out in the dark, in the howling winds, to change the antenna, to change the frequency, to retune the radio. And she came back looking green, clutching cold mugs of coffee, which she'd been in the radio hut for 24 hours. We had to be able to show the Americans that the expedition did have a scientific program. And that was where Ginny uh, came in uh, with real strength. I mean, it was she who was putting together this, this scientific program. And it was absolutely vital that that should stand up to scrutiny not only here, but even in, you know, Royal Society committees. And it did. On September the 2nd, 1979, the Transglobe expedition is officially launched from Greenwich, England. Crowned by Prince Charles' offer to be its patron, Ginny Fine's fanciful idea had become an awesome reality. If all went well, they'd be home in three years. When Ran and his team were well on their way to the South Pole and Ginny was still at, at base uh, at Rivingen, the uh, South African expedition close to them got into severe trouble and needed uh, an aircraft evacuation. The only aircraft that was conceivably within range uh, was in fact um, the Transglobe aircraft piloted by Giles, Giles Kershaw and it was then at the South Pole and uh, although London advised that it would be better not to use the aircraft because it would endanger the expedition, Ginny decided that notwithstanding that advice, she would use it in order to save the lives of the South African party. So it was on her say-so that that happened. And that was a, a tremendous part as a typically Ginny action. We were trying to thread our way through islands for thousands of miles and at any point, very often in the big storms, it felt as though the whole boat was going to be thrown over. And had that happened, we would have needed some form of rescue very quickly indeed. And Ginny knew that, and it was a very stressful time for her. Since leaving England, I do feel I changed a lot. I mean, life used to be great fun, and everything was just a huge giggle before. And it isn't any longer. I hope it's not just because one's growing older. The outlook is bleak. Barometers down to 97 and still falling. In return for meals and other favours at the Klondike River Lodge, Lady Fines makes up rooms and waits on table. Bye. I want the expedition to succeed for Ran, Charlie and everyone who's given so much. I didn't want anything out of it myself. I haven't really any personal ambitions, so to speak. I'm really just, you know, a housewife. At four in the morning, the support team in alert is awakened to discover the main supply shed consumed in flames. Ginny and the others can only look on helplessly. I'm afraid we've got extremely sad news. The whole garage has uh, been completely destroyed by fire and everything in it. I'm sorry to have to tell you that, but uh, it would be probably best if you can keep going. 
my life rather than breaking off and coming back. At the time of the fire and the breaking of the aircraft, Ginny had a truly dreadful time. She needed to stay awake for three days and three nights with no rest. Black coffee after black coffee. And she couldn't even go and make coffee because she had to stay at the radio signal. If she went away for a cup of tea and a more signal came through faintly asking for rescue, and then the ionosphere faded so we couldn't make signals anymore, she would be responsible for our lives. Ran and Charlie had got to the North Pole. And the problem then, of course, was that the summer was breaking up the ice and they had a uh, limited amount of time to travel before the ice would break up too much. So they found an ice floe which they stayed on for 99 days. And the problem then was, would they meet up with the ship? Would the ship be able to get to them? Because there was miles and miles of this sort of broken ice between them and the ship. The committee in London thought that the expedition should be concluded by the aircraft coming to pick Ran and Charlie up and fly them to Spitsbergen. And that way, the expedition was a success. Ginny, of course, had a different view, as we all did on the expedition, which was that by airlifting them off, that was a failure. But on the other hand, if she left them on the ice, and the ice broke up more, and we couldn't get the aircraft out to them, they'd be lost. I mean, you know, a very, very dangerous situation. So she had the awful dilemma of getting an instruction from the committee, telling her to get Ran and Charlie off the ice what to do with that instruction. And actually what she did was, she pretended she couldn't hear it. And thank God she did, because we were eventually with the ship and Ran and Charlie able to come together in the Arctic and they climbed up the side, up, up the boarding ladder. It was incredible. But what a brave decision for her to make because it would have been appalling if anything bad had happened. Ginny was awarded the Polar Medal, the first woman in history to receive it from the Queen and she was also made into the first female member of the exclusively all-male Antarctic club. She's of course recognised for the huge contribution she made as base commander for Transglobe. That's a job that no one would have liked. Absolutely impossible in all the things that went on. But Ginny in the centre of everything as base commander in charge of the communications, she'll always be remembered for that. And I think there are some who thought that when Rand got his gold medal here at the Society, Ginny deserved to be part of that as well. A feisty girl, as everybody knew. She wouldn't take any nonsense from Rand uh, or from anybody else. But you wouldn't have known it until you got to know her because she was so apparently meek and mild and well-mannered, but had this tremendous fire in her belly. Ginny had great reserves of stamina. She looked, everybody always comments on how slight and um, frail she looked, but she had great strength both physically and mentally. I can't think of anybody that anybody would want um, by their side in a crisis other than Ginny because she just dealt with everything that came her way.